Welcome to the Grant Cone Show. I'm Grant Cone. Here by myself on a Saturday morning. I could have done a Cone phone, but I feel like there isn't that much to talk about. And I have things that are sort of like off the beaten path. Like things that... Here's my thought process for the show today. When I meet fans, they don't ask me about the latest news with the Niners. They're not like, what's going on with Brandon Ayuk? It's always like, what's Brandon Ayuk like in the locker room? What is... Brock Purdy really like? What do you think of him? What's your relationship like with him? Members only stream. So if you want to participate, got to be a member, but I'll read all the, uh, comments in the chat you don't have to do super chats today so before we get into what the players are like i want to talk about breaking news fred warner and debo samuel threw out the first pitch at the giants game yesterday did you guys see this it's worth talking about these are two of the best athletes in the country fred warner is the best middle linebacker in the country debo by far the best wide back in the country and neither one could throw a baseball straight. Debo's was better. They were standing side by side. And why is my internet so bad? I don't understand. I hate this computer. I'm getting a new computer because it says my speed is fine. It says I got 351 megabits per second download and 25 megabits per second upload. And yet my computer can't do anything about it. I don't understand. I hate this computer. I hate it so much. Why does it say I have a bad internet connection when I don't have a bad internet connection? Why does it say there is a paper jam when there is no paper jam? What's that from? What's this text from? I'm mad. Take it back. This is the best show I've ever done. So what happened was the internet stopped working at my house. So now I'm on my hotspot. And I'm going to have a panic attack. Or I mean, I'm going to punch a wall. I'm feeling very angry right now. You know when you feel like rage build up inside you and you want to do something about it, but there's nothing you can do because it's essentially your fault or out of your control? That's how I feel right now. So I'm going to try to woosaw myself. Like in bad... That kind of sounded like a pause moment too, but I'm going to woosaw myself. Like bad boys too. So give me a second. Woosa. 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 See, this is why all my competitors are gaining on me. Audio quality's crap. Internet's crap. I used to be the number one guy on YouTube a couple years ago. Now, I'm terrible. I'm like 47th in the YouTube sphere. It's terrible. I don't even know why you guys watch me anymore. I'm washed. Cooked. All right, so what? I I'm going to make fun of Fred Warner and Debo for how they throw a ball when I don't even have good internet. I'm on a hot spot. It's ridiculous. 
I kind of want to end the stream right now. Sit outside, look at the sky. You know those parts of MTV Cribs where like they take you outside to like their backyard and say, this is where I just think about life. I need a spot like that where I just think about things. The show's going really well so far. Grant Cohn Show, everyone. It's the biggest show on YouTube right now. A lot of people are talking about it. A lot of people are talking about Brock Purdy's latest endorsements. You guys don't like my endorsements? Fine. Let's talk about Brock Purdy's. I think his are the most, are the cutest endorsements by far of anyone in the NFL. You got to give this guy credit. He's trying to scrap together some money. So aren't we all? And, you know, Nike, Adidas, Reebok, they haven't come crawling to Purdy yet, yet. So, you know, he's getting creative. And now he's got an endorsement deal with Corn. He's not the face of football yet. He's not the face of Nike, but he is the face of Corn. Have you seen this commercial? He's on a tractor. He's wearing cowboy boots underneath jeans. And boy, he's smiling his ass off. Got to give it up to Brock Purdy and his agent for finding creative ways to make money. But um, really, the, the commercial when you watch it looks like it's just poof. I thought it was a Saturday Night Live bit. Like if he were hosting Saturday Night Live, which I'm sure he will one day, Peyton Manning did, you're famous enough, you'll host Saturday Night Live. He has a great sense of humor. That would be the bit that they would make. Look, we're going to sort of play on the fact that you don't make any money and that you don't have any good endorsements and that middle America freaking loves you. So now you're the face of corn. You just got a mega multi-million dollar deal with corn. I think this is pretty good. And what I like about Brock Purdy is he's from Arizona. So he's not that different than me. I mean, Arizona, if you've been to Arizona, like that Phoenix area, it's very much like LA. It's a big urban sprawl. It's just, it's like the conservative version of LA. It's a red state, but it's not that far away. So that's where he's from. But he went to school in Iowa and I guess his wife or fiance, his wife lives in Iowa and he spends time out there and Middle America that just learned who Brock Purdy is loves the idea of him on a tractor in Iowa doing stuff with corn. I don't even know what you call it. Harvesting corn. It's not even who he is, but they sort of cosplayed him as a farmer. Like there's no there's no corn fields in Phoenix. It's too hot. Am I wrong? Anyway, I think it's interesting how Purdy has captured the imagination of middle America. And I'm not talking the Midwest. Like that was, that was Jimmy. He was the king of Chicago. Purdy is the king of like Nebraska, South Dakota, Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri. And he's not from there. I think it's pretty cool. You got to find, you got to play to your target market. What is it about Purdy that speaks to the people of Nebraska so much? Is it the fact that he doesn't have tattoos and shops at Kohl's and likes tractors? I mean, don't we all like tractors? If you had millions of dollars and access to a tractor, would you not drive it? Like if I had if I had $10 million, which he doesn't have, but if I had $10 million, I would own a tractor. I'd have a house with three stories just so I could have an elevator. Wouldn't want a fourth story, but I need that third story so I could have an elevator and a tractor. And I would need enough land so I could ride around the tractor. Would it have to be a cornfield? No. You could do an almond orchard in uh, Central Valley. But a tractor's definitely... How much fun is that? Ever since every guy since he was two years old, has been like obsessed with tractors. Am I wrong? So really, Brock Purdy's living the dream. He should get a tractor sponsorship. John Deere. I'm just saying. I'm really proud of Brock Purdy. I want to talk about my favorite quarterback I've ever covered. I've covered four starting quarterbacks. I don't count Brian Hoyer. He doesn't count. Or C.J. Beathard. It's Alex Smith, Colin Kaepernick, 
Jimmy Garoppolo and Brock Purdy. Kind of want to rank them in terms of how much I liked them. From least favorite to most favorite. My least favorite quarterback with the Niners would have to be Colin Kaepernick. Which is weird because when he got drafted, he was really, really, really nice. And a lot of times, even when he wasn't so nice, if you caught him on the right day in the locker room and asked him questions about him, he would be quite generous talking about himself. But most of the time, he was really antagonistic towards media and pretty much he didn't interact much with his teammates. He would walk. Remember Tebowing? Kaepernicking wouldn't be kissing your bicep. He'd be walking around your office with Beats headphones on, not talking to anyone. That's Kaepernicking. So he didn't really interact very much unless you sought him out. He really only wanted to talk about himself and he was hostile <laughs> most of the time. So he wasn't exactly fun to cover. I'm not saying I know these guys. I'm talking about my favorite people to cover. Kaepernick wasn't fun to cover. Jimmy was a step up from Kaepernick in the sense that he wasn't outwardly hostile. hostile. But that was really the only difference. Both quarterbacks were instant successes and it felt like the success went to their heads. Like Kaepernick was a normal guy and he was a celebrity. Jimmy Garoppolo was a backup quarterback and then he was a celebrity. And Jimmy would walk around the locker room almost like, like a celebrity. Like, I can't stay here too long. I don't want people to take pictures of me. No paparazzi, please. Hey, I, it's like, man, you're just a mediocre quarterback in Santa Clara. You couldn't really get to know Jimmy. Jimmy acted like there was eight levels of difference in, t in terms of social status between you and him. Um, and if you did ever walk up to Jimmy and talk to him about anything, he would kind of have this deer in the headlights look like, how did you get past my security team? Um, so, and then when you got him in a, in a group interview, he didn't really give you very, very much. Maybe he didn't have much to say, but I, I thought covering him was like sort of covering wallpaper. It's just there. Okay, well, that brings me to Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy is a lot of fun to cover because he's accessible. He just sits at his locker. Jimmy, Jimmy would never do that. Kaepernick would never do that without headphones on. Like They, they didn't want to be seen at, as accessible. Brock's just hanging out. And he's looking at his playbook. He's eating lunch. He's turned away from his locker, turned out toward the locker room, which means come talk. Starting quarterback in the NFL. I've never seen, I've never covered a, a Niners quarterback as accessible as Brock. He really has changed nothing about how he goes about his day to day since he became the starter. He acted the same way when he was the third string guy. Got to give a guy credit for that. Also, um, he's interested in other people. Like, I'll have fashion conversations with him. You, you think he's a guy who doesn't really think about clothes but he is he's got a nice little fashion sense he's got some nice bomber jackets and i like i have my derby jacket that i'm very proud of i have a couple derby jackets and i was telling him about it and so we talk about fashion if you catch him walking out of the locker room he'll walk with you he's the most down to earth well i can't say he's the most down to earth he still has some tests uh what happens when he gets paid what happens when he gets, gets a little bit older what happens when there's a movie made about him how down to earth will he be? But so far, he's passed all the tests. He's a dream to cover. And I feel grateful. I think everyone on the Niners beat is great. This guy appeared out of nowhere because he's wonderful. Only thing about him is he tries really hard to give good answers in group interviews. And I think he almost tries too hard. Like you can shoot from the hip a little bit more. You can, be, you can show a little bit more. You can be a little more animated. But I think he'll get that with age. That just comes with experience. I really have no complaints with Brock. But I want to, he is in the same boat as Jimmy and Kaepernick in the sense that all three of them had instant success. Instant success. And it's clear that Brock handled it the best because Jimmy and Kaepernick couldn't really continue their success. Maybe Brock's going to fall off this year. But it seems like Brock's going to, maintain a level of consistency that Jimmy and Kaepernick couldn't. Um, and maybe that's just their approach to the profession. Reason I feel like Alex Smith is still 
the quarterback I respect the most that I've covered. I didn't have a personal relationship with him. I was 23, 24 when he was in the team and I was still kind of timid going out to meet people. I mean, I was looking at Alex Smith like, man, I, I watched you in high school. But Alex Smith was not an instant, instant success. Alex Smith, at least when I started covering the team, was a joke. Unfairly, I mean, now that we know what his career ended up being, he ended up being a respectable quarterback, a good quarterback, a winning quarterback. But in 2011, 2012, he had been a punchline. He had been ridiculed. He had been booed by his own fans. And he didn't really let it affect how he interacted with anyone. He was relentlessly professional. He he was great. Great teammate. Great with the media. Um, not a great player, but a good player. And I, he went all that through all that stuff from like 21 to 26. That's incredible. I think he deserves more credit in retrospect of what sort of he was put through by the organization and fans. Brock hasn't had to deal with that. Jimmy never had to deal with that. Cap never had to deal with that. Just being booed from the onset. You're not Aaron Rodgers. We hate you. You're not good enough. We want David Carr. Right? That's the kind of stuff he had to deal with. And I'll never forget, he got benched. It was 2012. They were going to the Super Bowl and he just got, he was walking through the locker room. A bunch of media stopped him. Hey, Alex, we talked for a second. And of course he said yes, because he's Alex Smith. He wouldn't say no, like, I don't know, Jimmy. And all the questions about Kaepernick. When did you know Kaepernick would be this good? What's the best quality about Kaepernick? How did this offense reach a new level with Kaepernick? I mean, really kind of disrespectful questions to Alex Smith. Un insensitive, not disrespectful, but insensitive. Knowing that Alex Smith was, you know, dying inside that he lost his job because of an injury. And he stood there in the middle of the locker room and answered every freaking question about Kaepernick in a very generous spirit. And really, that was Kaepernick's best year, if you think about it, when Alex Smith was his backup. I really think having Alex Smith there, day to day, for Kaepernick, game planning, preparing, practicing during the game, helped Kaepernick. Because Alex Smith was one of the more prepared, uh, serious, cerebral quarterbacks of his generation. He was not as gifted as Kaepernick or Brock. Was he as gifted as... I think he was as gifted as Jimmy. I think he was more gifted than Jimmy. He could run. Go back and watch Alex Smith in his 20s. That dude could run. Jimmy can't. Never could. So I still get, We got to give Alex Smith some props. He's been gone a long time, but he was humiliated. He was thrown... He was humiliated for years. Then he was propped up for one year and then humiliated again. Tossed out of town and Andy Reid uh, had his best years with Andy Reid. I don't want to talk about Alex Smith too much. Um, who we got over here? Let me read some of these comments since no super chats today. Uh, Gorgira Von Jinx is still trying to give away that jersey. Clearly nobody wants it bad enough to go through the hassle of signing up for these stupid websites like Sleeper. A lot of people do. I'm just giving you guys an opportunity. It helps me. If you're not interested, that's okay. But someone did win this. A lot of people signed up. I emailed the guy three times. He didn't get back to me. So if you want it, sign up. If you don't, it's cool, but it helps me out. Just like eating corn would help out Brock. I'm going to eat extra corn today for Brock. Hey, Grant, sorry to poop on your sponsors. Good that you can get the money, but we are tired of the ads just like watching commercial TV. Sorry. It's part of the deal. Just like, you know, watching ads is part of the deal with watching football. Members only podcast. Yup. Haven't done one of these in years. Why is your internet so bad lately? I don't know. I blame you, Dave. Now I'm on my hotspot. Trying to be cool like brother Bob. Fred sucks so hard. This is why I'm not tech savvy. Dang computers. Technology irritates me. Yes. I'm freezing. Yeah, that was a good time. I, I enjoyed that. Hey, what's up? Ricardo. Um, way too much bet US and not enough actual football talk. I'm just saying. Hold on. We do about three to four minutes of Bet US in an hour show. So that's 56 minutes of football talk, four minutes of sponsor. Mr. Amazing. 
well, you know what you can do? You can earmuff it if you don't like it. it. Looks a little downsy. Working at my house trying to get it sold. Good luck. Um, I'm back. Don't punch a wall. Grant, take a breath. Pull the ears. Okay. Good to know, Dave. We're all here. Good to see you. You have the internet equivalent of Kyle Shane and he can't close the deal. That is true. I'll take that. I deserve that. Face of corn. Kaepernick was way better than Jimmy. As a player? Agree. I would agree. Sounds like the team couldn't get to know Jimmy since he went MIA all offseason. I mean, he was kind of MIA even when he was there. He would make brief cameo appearances. Like, no, please, no. Hey, yes, it's me. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. He was like Drake. Gotta love the haters. Uh, if the Niners signed Tyler Boyd, who was the odd man out? I mean, obviously, Ayuk. How could they afford to give Tyler Boyd $10 million a year and Ayuk $27 million a year and Debo $24 million a year? That wouldn't make sense. I, wouldn't make, I don't think it, it could do it. It would have to be Ayuk and then probably J Jawan Jennings next year. That's the thing. Jawan Jennings isn't coming back. I would highly doubt it. And speaking of sponsors, I want to shout out my sponsor real quick. BetUS, the number one online sports book. So if you're trying to make any wager online, Sports, non-sports, you go to BetUS because they're currently offering 125% deposit match up to $2,500 on your first three deposits. Not your first, first three. That means if you put it like, say, 500 bucks, you'll have 1250 And BetUS is 24-7 customer service. And they have 24-hour payouts. All you got to do is click the link in the description to receive your bonus. Also giving away 125 bucks in free play. I've already done this. Seriously. If you want free money to go wager on BetUS, DM me on Twitter I'll, uh, and just show me like a screenshot of your account number and I'll give you 25 bucks. That turns into, what's 125% of 25? I don't know, but it's more than 25. So let's go on BetUS right now and wager on Brock Purdy to win the MVP because I think he will because I'm a big Brock Purdy fan. You know why? Because he has corn in his corner. Corn. Brock Purdy. Most valuable player. Hold on. Let me take present, share screen, screen, boom, boom. Okay, Brock Purdy, most valuable player. Going down, Brock Purdy. I'm a big Brock Purdy fan, 1,400, 10 bucks to win 140. But I want to I place lots of bets because I like to hedge because I'm not that certain about anything in life. So what about Sam Darnold to win? He's plus 800. That's not even that. Like, those are crazy, incredible odds. Sam Darnold, I got to put him in. 10 bucks. To win 800? I mean, how do you pass that up? George Kittle to win. Uh, definitely, for sure. 10 bucks. To win $4,000? Of course. Definitely doing that. Hitting that. What else do I like? What else do I like? Mostert. If it's not plus 40,000 odds, I don't like it. Marvin Harrison Jr., of course, definitely, definitely, hold on, yes, I want that, no, I can't do that, I got to do 10 bucks, they're scared, 3,000, look at all those potential winnings right there, place my bet, total win, almost $8,000, I'm probably going to win all of it because there's going to be a four-way tie for the MVP next year, boom, there it is. That's how we do. Hey, last commercial, I promise. BetUS, America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. BetUS, where the game begins. All right, thanks for bearing with me on that. I want to take you back in the locker room. I'm going to tell you what... Brock's like in the locker room, what Bose is like in the locker room. I'm going to tell you my favorite player I've ever covered. I'm going to tell you my least favorite player I've ever covered. I'm going to save that one to the end. I'm going to try my internet at home. I'm trying to get off my high spot, so bear with me for a second. Did that, is that better? Before I tell you my least favorite player, I'm building suspense with bad internet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
think we're good. Oh, we're so good. We're beautiful. The best internet you've ever seen. Okay, here we go. We're back. So, who do you think Purdy hangs out with in the locker room? Curious. Do you guys know? Have you heard? Have you heard? Do you guys know? What is Purdy doing in the locker room when he's not hanging out with the media? Is he shooting hoops with Debo? No. Debo shooting hoops, Ayuk, Diamador Lenore. That's like one side, but Purdy's on the other side. And he's usually kicking it with a few people. Colton Kivitz. They're buddies. Um, Charlie Werner, who's not in the team anymore. Ross Dwelly, who's not in the team anymore. And that's pretty much his crew, which I think is interesting. He's not necessarily like, he's still really young, but he is a leader. So you don't see him sort of trying to pander to the older players on the team. He's not trying to like be a people pleaser. He's trying to be the, the center of his domain. But, you know, Kittle isn't in his orbit. McCaffrey isn't in his orbit. The older players aren't necessarily hanging around with Brock. So he sits around with his hat backwards, chopping it up with the backup tight ends and the right tackle. That's his little crew. And eventually it'll, it'll add on and it'll be bigger. But um, it's going to be interesting because he lost two members of it. D- Dwelly, good guy. Charlie Warner, gone. So now I think the Niners are not only drafting for their roster, but they're drafting for Brock Purdy's social circle. Who's he going to hang out with in the locker room? Who's going to go up to him? Now, one more person that you see Purdy hanging out with because it's his locker mate to his left, Dre Greenlaw. Those two talk a lot, which is kind of interesting because what do they talk about? One guy's a quarterback, one guy's a weak side linebacker. Seems like they wouldn't have a whole lot of overlap in terms of football, but they've been locker mates for three years, well, two years. So Greenlaw and Purdy seem like they're pretty close. And it's always interesting when an offensive player and a defensive player have a relationship because you don't always see that. It's almost like two teams. Team tries to split up the lockers and have offensive guys next to defensive guys, but they don't always... Those two, though. So that's Purdy's crew. Jewish guy says the whites. Not all the whites. Did someone sign Ross to boss? I don't think so. And a lot of people are like... I saw people going, go up to me on Twitter saying... Are you f- finally willing to uh, finally willing to admit that Ross Dwelly isn't that guy? It's like he was on the team for about six years. I called it. <laughs> no, they didn't use him per se. I would have, but he looked, he's almost thirty years old. I think he had a respectable career. He ended up in Purdy's crew. Okay, Nick Bose is very interesting. He's the highest paid player in the team. He's a captain. He's makes more money than just about anyone except Jed York there. So what is Bosa like? Now, he's about 26 years old. He's just won the Media's Good Guy Award, the uh, Gary Niver Award. We all like him. I like Nick Bosa a lot. He's available. He takes his media responsibilities very seriously. He always wants to be the first one to talk. He's candid. Um, he's plain spoken. He doesn't give you coach speak. He gives you a little bit more than the coaches. He's great. But what's he like with his teammates? It's interesting. He will show up on a scooter. You know, like those scooters on the street where you can pay for time and you can just ride around the city. The the Niners have some scooters. And I guess Bosa doesn't want to waste an extra step. He's very conscious of exercise, recovery. You know, he's like the most regimented person, disciplined person ever. And I guess he can't take extra steps. He has a certain amount of steps that he's budgeted out for his day. And so he just arrives in a scooter. And it seems dangerous scooting around, but everyone is aware. Hey, there's Bosa on a scooter. So he scoots in, goes to his locker, doesn't really talk to any players, talks to the media, and then scoots out. And I'd like to think, again, I don't have millions of dollars, but one day, certainly, of course, I will. We all will. And I like to think about how I will act 
when I just have a stupid amount of money. And I think using a scooter is something I want to do most of the time. I don't, wh why should I walk really when I could scoot? Kind of reminds me of that show Arrested Development where the older brother, what was his name? I don't even remember. Will Arnett would just go any, everywhere in a Segway scooter just because. I want to do that. In fact, I think it's too bad that they don't have Segway scooters. Do people use Segway scooters anymore? I've never been on a Segway scooter. They look incredible. That'd be the next way that Bosa could take his game up to the next level. Segway scooter. But there is something that exudes wealth when it's like, look, man, I just I don't need to walk right now. Beep, beep. I like how quiet Nick Bosa is. He like never raises his voice. Even when he's mic'd up during games, he's like, man, this is really fun. I like Nick Bosa. I think he's quite enjoyable to cover. Pause. My car engines just went. I could use a scooter. Okay. This is my favorite player on the 49ers. I have, before I name my favorite player, I'm going to talk about the different position groups because I feel like they all have personality types and I have a favorite. They're all interesting. Offensive linemen are very interesting. But I've never really had that close of a relationship with any of them. Not McGlinchey, not McKivitz, not Feliciano, not Brendel. I like Aaron Banks. I went up to Aaron Banks this year and told him that I'm from Oakland. He's from Aaron, uh, Alameda. He's an East Bay guy. And I feel like East Bay isn't that big. And if you're from here, then you know someone. And you, and you have mutual friends with everyone who's from here. So it's my East Bay guy. I like Aaron Banks a lot. But he's not my favorite player I've covered. It's only been a few years with Banks. I don't know him that well. Offensive linemen are very interesting. Thoughtful. Tight ends can be um, very flamboyant. And I consider myself to be flamboyant. Animated. Vernon Davis. George Kittle. But sometimes I feel like tight ends, like, they're almost the good ones are like caricatures. You know what I mean? Isn't Travis Kelsey a bit of a caricature? George, like, when they get to this level, it's like, what's the real George? So, it's not Kittle, although I like covering Kittle. Wide receivers are tough, especially when they're good, because they're usually like 25, and they have the biggest ego on the team. I wouldn't say wide receivers are necessarily my favorite players in the team. Backup quarterbacks are cool, because they have no ego, and they have this incredible vision of what's going on. Starting quarterbacks are tough to get around, although Brock Purdy's different. He's got the mentality of a backup. Running backs are interesting. But they're often very serious and I've never really had that close relationship with any running back on the team. Frank Gore didn't like me, although he came up to me during training camp last year. Have I told the story? He came up to me during training camp last year. He didn't remember that I covered him. But he was like, hey man, aren't you that dude that got into with Javon Kinla? And I was like, yeah. And he, was, he just laughed. <laughs> he laughed. By the way, I said goodbye to Javon Kinlaw before he left. After the NFC Championship game. I didn't tell anyone this. But after the NFC Championship game, I went up to Javon in his locker. I hadn't talked to him since that all that happened. And I said, hey Javon. And he turned and he said and he just looked at me, and I said, congratulations. And he said, thank you. And that was that. Javon Kinlaw actually is one of the... I will look back on the Javon Kinlaw eras. I enjoyed covering him. What an explosive way to meet someone. People don't realize. That was the first day I met him in person when that thing happened. I had never met him before, and that was a quirk of the pandemic. But, yeah, I said, congrats. He said, thanks. And that was sort of the goodbye. I wonder if I'll ever see him again. But I liked him. Um, defensive linemen are sensitive. Have you noticed that? Defensive linemen are sensitive. I don't get it. Uh, linebackers are like little coaches on the field. Robert, uh, yeah, I'd say Robert Sala. Fred Warner is like Robert Sala Jr. 
and I like Robert Sala, but Fred Warner is like doing a Robert Sala impression as opposed to just being himself. Uh, Dre Greenlaw is a lot of fun. He's cool. I like him a lot. I, I guess I, what I want to say is the players on defense who are involved in the highest velocity collisions are my favorite. Not the defense alignment, although they're cool, but those are guys, you know, in hand-to-hand combat. The ones who run around and try to take your head off are my favorite players, and I don't know why. They're the most vicious. They're about, they, they look like they're normal. They're about my size, about 5'10 to 6'2, 180 to 210. They're like normal people. And when you talk to them in the locker room, they're very, usually quiet and businesslike. Like they're in their alter ego. They kind of come across as superheroes. You see them in the locker room, they look normal, but you get on the field and they'll kill you. I like those guys. So Greenlaw's like that. Uh, Jimmy Ward was like that. Jimmy Ward's one of my favorite players ever to cover. Traverius Ward is like that. He's really, really funny. Traverius Ward and approachable. One of the things like there's a lot of women in the locker room to cover the team. And I wonder how comfortable they are going up to certain players because you know some, some guys can be standoffish. He's always talking to any female reporter who wants to know something about the Niners. He's very approachable. Seems like a good guy. He'll talk to guys too. The Amador Lenore is really cool. He's wait a couple years on him. He's got a voice. He's got something to say. He's just really young. But my favorite player really on the team right now is Talanoa Hafunga. I really like Talanoa Hafunga to the point where I can't even really, I can't even really talk about him objectively anymore. He's, I like him. He's not my friend, but when I see him, He'll say hello to me. He knows my name. I'll say hello to him. He's just a really good guy. And what to me makes a, a, a young athlete a good guy is someone who's interested in other people. That's the thing about DBs. They're vicious on the field, but then you talk to them in the locker room and they're like, they have this very soft voice. Hey, man, how you doing? What's going on with you? They ask you questions. It's incredible. Only position group, I think, in, in football that really is interested in other people. DBs. Maybe because they're going to kill you later. I don't know why they're interested in you, but they are. And like Talanoa last year early on, like I, was, I was talking to him and he would say stuff like, hey man, just want you to know I really like your show. I get it. Like, really? How many football players get what I do? A lot of them don't. And even if they do, how, would they, how many of them would have the, the guts to say it to me in front of their teammates when so many of their teammates don't like me? I really like Talanoa and I hope they keep him because it's nice to have one person on the team that I get along with. When they got rid of Jimmy Ward, that hurt. That was my guy. I could go up to him every day. How you doing? What's going on with you? A lot of players on this team don't like me because of what happened with Kinlaw. Fair enough. Talanoa wasn't one of them. And I respect the guy who doesn't just go along with because it seems like when you're on a team, you're, there's a lot of pressure to have a united front. We don't like that reporter. We all don't like him. Well, Talon is his own person. Jimmy Ward is his own person. They think for themselves. Tight ends think for themselves. Do offensive linemen think for themselves? They're a unit. You think of the secondary as a unit, but they're a bunch of little assassins. I'm sorry. Dante Whitner, super nice. Really well put together. Assassin. Deshaun Goldson, super laid back and chill. Assassin. Jimmy Ward will kill you. Super nice guy. I love DBs, particularly safeties. Safeties. Corners can be a little touchy. Richard Sherman. They get beat and they don't want to talk about it. Safeties, you don't really know when safeties get beat. You only really notice safeties when they're destroying someone. And I think they play on that. Like, oh, you think I'm this vicious? No, man, I'm a family guy. I'm a businessman. Like, yeah, okay. Talano Hufunk is my favorite player on the team. Please extend him. What happened with Huff being on the show? I'm going to tell you what happened with Huff being on the show. It's clear he was uncomfortable about it. Like, I got, I was going to do a weekly show with Ray Ray McLeod. As soon as he announced it publicly, I believe he got a bunch of calls from teammates being like, don't do this. So I don't think Talanoa wants that smoke. I don't think he needs it. So instead of him saying, I can't do it, he was like, 
I'll do one maybe later. And I just was like, look, man, I even went up to him halfway through the season, like, look, dude, I can tell you have anxiety about this. You don't have to do it. We're good. And he like thanked me. It's he doesn't really do media. And he was gonna, he had a tough time saying no to me because we get along. But I let him off the hook. Maybe later in his career when he's got a little bit. I think it's tough to do those interviews before you're like 30 years old. And if you go back and think about it, Jimmy Ward did it and then they got rid of him. If you want to have a future with an organization and you want to get an extension, maybe don't do a show with Grant Cohn. I'm just, you know, I, I don't want to put him in that position. I think it's the kind of thing you do when you know you're, you're leaving. And in retrospect, when Jimmy Ward did that show with me, I wonder if he knew he was leaving. It's like, well, hey, man, they're screwing me over. Fuck it. I'll go talk to Grant. So Hufunga, God love him. He's like 23. He's not there yet. He need, still needs to protect his interests with the 49ers. I let him off the hook. And I don't want to be in a position where I'm begging any player on the team to come on my show because I don't need him. And I don't want to be compromised. I need to be able to say, hey, Talanoa, you, bl- you blew it on this play. Hey, Ray Ray McLeod, you should have jumped on the ball. Imagine if I had been doing a weekly show with Ray Ray McLeod and then he blew it in the Super Bowl and I would have had to been like, hey, well, that's my co-host. I can't really say anything. Like, I don't want to be in that position. I'm only loyal to BetUS and my sponsors. No one on the team. So that's what happened with Huff on the show. Uh, okay, so let me talk about my least favorite player on the team. The, my least favorite player I've ever covered. Can you guys guess before I say it? Least favorite player I've ever covered. I think there's been some real jerks. I mean, there's always jerks, right? I'm a jerk. I saved this for the end. I wanted to be positive first, but my least favorite player I've ever covered. Yeah. Eric Armstead. I felt Eric Armstead was... had a chip on his shoulder the whole time. Just the moment he was drafted. At no point was he happy to talk to anyone in the media. When he did talk to the media, I felt he was essentially filibustering. He would have the longest group interviews and say the least, somehow. But that's not why I didn't like him. Armstead is like, fine, dude. I had no issue with Armstead until it was time for him to get his extension like five years ago. Four years ago. And I wrote on Twitter that I didn't think they should give him an extension. I thought they, I said they should sign Clowney instead. Maybe not sign Clowney, but I, I wrote that. And he like quote tweeted it and really, really upset him. And I forget exactly what he said, but ever since that day, like once a year out of nowhere, he would just take shots at me on Twitter about nothing or about something else. But it was all because I wrote one time on Twitter that the Niners shouldn't extend his contract. He flipped out about that and never, ever, 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 ever let it go. I thought that was petty. Um, to the point where like, he's the pettiest player I've ever covered. He's the only player ever who wouldn't answer my questions in a group uh, interview. A couple years ago in Seattle, I asked a question after a game and I asked him about a teammate who did a good job. And he said, next question, which I thought was petty. Like, Debo doesn't like me. Debo blocked me on Twitter. Debo answers my questions. Like, I can make Debo laugh. Debo will say hello to me in the locker room. And he blocked me on Twitter. Arm says petty. So, finally, and this is crazy because I'm petty too, I gotta say. I felt it was a little over the, over the top. So, finally, the last time I ever saw him, was in the locker room after the Super Bowl. Not the lock, not not a couple of days after the Super Bowl. You know when they're clearing when they're clearing out their locker, and you go up to one person one by one and you talk, you ask them about what they're going to be doing in the off season or injuries stuff like that. So I don't go to Eric Armstead to ask questions anymore. He doesn't want to answer my questions. Fair enough, but he's hurt. One, he got this meniscus injury. Two, two. He was one of the guys after the Super Bowl that mentioned that he didn't know the rules. And that the coaches didn't tell him. So I like went over to listen. To listen. I wasn't going to ask a question. Just to hear what he had to say. See if someone would follow up about what he said. About the rules and all that. He saw me within a 10 foot radius. Like he saw me approach. 
he really said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because someone was asking me a question. He stopped the group interview. He looked at me and did this. He shooed me away like a rat. Okay, fair enough. I won't listen to your group interview. Fine. I don't care. Like, I don't need... First of all, as I said earlier, Eric Armstead group interviews are the most boring group interviews of all time. So he did me a favor. He saved eight minutes of my life that, I'll, that I would never have gotten back. But it's dehumanizing to do that to anyone. You know what I mean? It's like, it's the kind of thing you would do to, I don't know, not a human being. And I was offended. I've never done that to someone. And I feel like, how rich would you have to be before you started suing people with your hand? So I remembered it, but I was like, okay, Armstead doesn't like me. It's not the first time he's disrespected me. But then when the Niners cut him, when the Niners cut him and they, before they cut him, they offered him a $6 million contract. I mean, am I wrong? But the Niners essentially gave him this one. Like you did it to me and then the Niners did it to you. So you ever heard that term schadenfreude? A little. I had a little. I, I hate, and I, I feel like it's unprofessional to say it, but just the way the Niners got rid of him was like, oh, wow. So now you know how it feels to get sued away. That's what it feels like, Eric. And he said he felt extremely disrespected. I agree. Doesn't it feel extremely disrespectful when someone goes like this to you? Tells you to get the hell out of there? Who cares about the nine years that you gave to the organization and all you did in the community? Goodbye. No, but if you want to stay, here's $6 million. See that to me, and everything worked out for Armstead, right? He got his deal with Jacksonville. He's good. But it's like, if you treat people like that, it's going to come back around. I think. I don't know that much about life. I've been on the world, on the earth for 36 years. I think if you treat people like that, it's going to come back around. So, all the best in Jacksonville. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. But wouldn't you feel that way if someone treats you like that? Like what? Because I said the Niners shouldn't extend your contract in 2020. Like I'm your mortal enemy. This is a guy who wanted to be the man of the year. I, just a flat out bully. A flat out petty bully. So that was my least favorite player I ever covered, man. Always had a chip on his shoulder. One time I was hanging out in Dallas before they played Dallas in the, in the playoffs. And I had to get my credential from their hotel. And it was like some four seasons outside of Dallas. It's an incredible place. So I was like, I'm not leaving here. I'm going to do my work here today and get a drink. Um, and I saw Eric Armstead hanging out in the same lobby with his parents. I mean, it's an incredible place. And I wanted to go over and be like, hey, Eric, man, it's really ni nice to see you. But I realized like, I don't think he would appreciate that. <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe one day at like the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame when someone's inducting him. Do you think he'll be in the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame? I'm thinking he won't. But if he is, maybe we can reconcile. Is that the word? Reconcile? I don't think so. Because we weren't ever cool. Reconcile would imply you were cool at one point. We were never cool. Anyway. The Niners. That's why I was like, I'm sorry. I mean, also, I wonder why the Niners did that to him. It was so disrespectful. It was. I wonder if they had enough of him too. Amicable. Hall of Fame for what? Plantar fasciitis? So Grant, who's your favorite CC? And who's your least? Content creator? See, you got, there's like content creator wars going on right now. And the way I look at it is I feel like I'm in a unique position because, correct me if I'm wrong, I kind of feel like I birthed this. I don't mean to be too ego, egotistical here, but like I launched everyone. Even if I didn't do it directly. Everyone uses my format. So they're all my children. Everyone is my children, even the ones I don't work with anymore. It's hard to say who my favorite one is. They all do a good job. Larry is my son. He's about 25 years older than me, but Larry is my son. I'm his father. That's the way it is. I'm also Jose's father. Are all my content creator collaborators going to get mad at me and, and stop working me because I said I was their father? Hey, man, that's not cool. I have a dad. Nope, it's me. Sorry. They're all my kids. All my children. I can't choose between them. I just wish they would stop bickering. 
and stop asking me to break it up. What am I? I'm 36 years. I'm younger than everyone doing this. What do I need to do? I love Ryan. I love Jesse. I love Coach. I mean, these are guys I talk to on the phone all the time. Like, we have group text messages. I love these guys. Which is crazy. They're some of my best friends. And I've never met the coach in real life. I've met Ryan once. And Jesse stayed at my house for a week. <laughs> I am their dad. So when people try to ask me, hey, who is... No, I can't do that. They're all my children. I love them equally. What's your favorite story of your dad's in the locker room? My favorite story of my dad's. I mean, when I was there, there's an epic story that he's told about him and Randy Moss, but I was in college. I wasn't there. One time in Nashville, Tennessee, Niners were playing Titans. And after the game, I want to say, my dad went up to Anquan Bolden just to ask him some questions. And Anquan Bolden was really not helpful with the media. He would sort of talk under his, he was like, he just wouldn't talk very much. Like Jordan, no, you know, a mumbler. Fine. He's better than Michael Crabtree. Michael Crabtree didn't know what to say. Didn't want to talk to the, the media. And um, my dad was talking to Bolden. Bolden was being kind of not helpful. Crabtree came up and started making fun of my dad in some way. He, I don't think he knew who my dad was. Um, and my dad really got pissed off. And I don't remember exactly what Crabtree said, but he didn't want it with my dad. My dad had one of these little recorders. You know, he puts it, he's like 5'7". He looks up at, at, the, at, the, <laughs> at the athletes, right up in their face, but a little bit shorter than them with this recorder. And all of a sudden, Crabtree starts mouthing off. And my dad turns, and he puts it right in his face. You got something to say? You got something to say? Go ahead and say it. <laughs> and Crabtree's like, oh, oh. He just walks out, and my dad follows him out of the locker room. No, 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 no. I want to know what you think. I want to know what you think. Chases Crabtree out, comes back, and finishes the interview with Anquan. Okay, let's keep going. Anquan was like, okay, whatever you need, buddy. My dad's insane. In a good way. And it's cool because like, he's not insane. He's just a New Yorker. And I think to Californians or people who aren't from Brooklyn, they're just like, wow, that was very uh, direct and aggressive. What the fuck? But my dad kind of uses that to his advantage. He knows he's willing to go places that people aren't willing to go socially. Um, and Crabtree found out he was going to learn today. He didn't know, but he was going to learn today. That shit was too funny. Anquan Bolden learned the easy way. Crabtree learned the hard way. Who's my favorite comment creator? Definitely you. Brother Bob's good, although he's the biggest instigator in the, in the Niners content creator community. I can see Brother Bob just sitting at home listening to classical music, drinking red wine, and starting shit. You too, Matt. Kruger just sent me two bottles of wine. Shout out to uh, Larry Kruger. That was very nice of him. I appreciate it. Uh, let me make sure I didn't miss any of these. Danny, thank you. Druish guy. Crank Cone Show, what a great idea. Yeah, that was, this is fish and chips. He emails me sometimes and I don't always respond. Sorry, but I get them and it was your idea. Thank you. And I know you sent me another one with more ideas about this. I will get to him. Druish guy. Greenlaw and BA are my two favorite players. They're two of my favorite players, too. I know why you feel that way. Sean McGee, what's your favorite story? Your dad's in the locker room. Got that. Vincent Campos. I haven't been watching the streams outside of yours. What CCs are beefing? Oh, I don't know. I don't even know. It's a good question. It's a better question for other people. I don't, I don't know. Um, thank you for bearing with me today. The beginning of the show was just a freaking disaster. I'm slipping, man. I'm cooked. All the things people say about me on Twitter are true getting passed up in this field, but thank you guys for rocking with me. It's been like four years of me doing this and uh, I want to say I'm retiring today. I'm done. Actually, I'm out of retirement. That was it. It was a brief retirement, but I'm coming back. So let everyone know Grant Cohn's out of retirement. He retired and now it's his comeback season. It's a whole new me. Jay-Z did it. Too Short did it. Why can't I retire and unretire just as a marketing stunt? It works. I just retired. Boom, I'm back. Let everyone know, Grant Cohn, unretired, back to running the streets, the YouTube streets. 
the toughest streets there are. I'm, I'm getting out of here, but before I do, Brother Bob wants to know, do you think we are legit Super Bowl contenders this year if we trade B.A. this offseason? I mean, can we, can we look at Brandon Ayuk's stats in the, super, in the playoffs real quick? Can we do that? Okay. Um, he had nine catches in the playoffs this year. Nine. It's three a game. Yeah, I think they can. Now, he's great. But they don't use him that much. Three catches a game? Like, what are they going to do without those three freaking catches a game? And one of the catches was like, save their season, for sure. The one that bounced off the dude's face? Incredible catch. But other than that, he didn't do much in the playoffs. So yeah, I think that'd be all right. Do we get to the play? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The team is loaded. I think they would. Maybe I'm wrong. But I'm getting, I'm not saying like get rid of Ayuk and then don't replace the position. Draft a guy and sign Tyler Boyd. I think that'd be all right. I mean, they're running the ball anyway. I mean, I'm wrong. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Time for me to do some other work. I'll be back tomorrow. We'll do like a, a, a later cone phone. How about that? Like a late afternoon cone phone? After you take a nap? After brunch? All right, see you guys later.